we're gonna Will we be starting on Berkeley time? On the dot. It's your lunch time now? For me, it is, uh, it is lunch time. <laughs> but I had an earlier, I had a late breakfast. One, it's one o'clock. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to our event today, Design Politics, the Border and the Passport with Ronald Rael and Mahmoud Kishavars. Before we begin, let me note that there's captioning available. You can click the button on the lower right hand of the screen. Um, I'm going to begin with a land acknowledgement. We take a moment to recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chocheno speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Mawekma, Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold the University of California Berkeley more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. My name is Letty Volpe and I'm the director of the Center for Race and Gender here at Berkeley. I want to first thank our co-sponsors for today's event, the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative, the College of Environmental Design, the Department of Scandinavian, and the Latinx Research Center. Um, this is an event of uh, the Center for Race and Gender's Native Immigrant Refugee Crossings Research Initiative, which seeks to put these siloed categories or communities in conversation. The initiative has created three other events uh, that are coming up this semester that you should also know about. April 5th at 4 p.m. on indigenous migration, April 15th at 12 p.m. on chronopolitics and knowledge production in migration studies, and April 22nd at 4 p.m. on migration and the crisis imaginary. Um, let me now introduce our two speakers for today. I'm so excited to have them here together in this virtual space. 
Um, and after we hear from them, we'll open it up for discussion. So please post any questions or comments to the Q&A button on your screen and we will try to address all of them. Our first speaker is Ronald Rayo, who is the Ava Lee Memorial Chair in Architecture and Director of the Masters of Architecture program with a joint appointment in the Department of Architecture, the College of Environmental Design and the Department of Art Practice at UC Berkeley. Rael is the author of Border Wall as Architecture, a manifesto for the UC for the US Mexico boundary, Earth Architecture, and Printing Architecture, Innovative Recipes for 3D Printing. Rael works as both a scholar and creative practitioner in the areas of border wall studies, additive manufacturing, and earthen architecture. His work has won multiple prizes, including the Beasley Award in 2021 for the design of the year for Teeter Totter Wall with Virginia San Fratello and Colectivo Chopeque. Mahmoud Kashavars is a senior lecturer in design studies at HDK V. Baland Academy of Art and Design at the University of Gothenburg, as well as research associate at the Engaging Vulnerability Research Program in the Department of Cultural Anthropology and Ethnology at Uppsala University in Sweden. Keshavars is the author of The Design Politics of the Passport, Materiality, Immobility, and Descent, and co-editor of the forthcoming Seeing Like a Smuggler, Borders from Below, with Sharam Kosravi. Keshavars is a founding member of Decolonizing Design, and of critical border studies. So thank you both so much for being here. And um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to our first speaker. Thank you, Liddy. I'm going to talk about a few projects that um, myself and my creative practice have been working on over the last few years that have to do with combining many of the things that you were talking about. Um, Additive manufacturing, the border wall, earthen architecture. Um, and they all come from this place that is a real um, geographic place in the world. Um, and I call it an expanded borderlands to think about where we are within the United States and what its history is, but to th also think about how the borderlands themselves are places that are constantly in flux. It's these are places where people of different languages, different cultures and customs of belief systems, foods are rubbing up against each other in beautiful ways and in uh, sometimes violent ways and sometimes ridiculous ways. And so the, the creative work that my practice does fe feeds upon that or is fueled by the borderlands themselves. And I right now am coming to you from a very special place in the United States to me, which is uh, a high alpine valley that's bordered by 14,000 foot mountains and it crosses the border between Colorado and New Mexico. This is called the San Luis Valley. And what's special about it also is that it, up until the Mexican American War, this was a place that was the northernmost frontier of the territory of Mexico. And so we, we continue to live um, within the context of a historic borderlands within the architecture, the, the food, the customs, the culture. And it's a place of migration, um, but it's also a place where my family has lived for thousands of years. And so I'm interested in this idea of a territory in flux and how certain things arrive to a territory or people arrive to a territory and others uh, might leave that territory. And so among the projects I'm doing is thinking about how technologies might come or how I might leave and go back between Berkeley and here. But it, these are the, the buildings of this landscape and I'm actively restoring several of these buildings in my architecture practice. But my own home, which is made out of mud, which is a five generation house, is something that I use as a teaching instrument. I teach people how to build using indigenous and traditional uh, ways. This is a mud house um, that my great grandfather's sister's family built. I teach people how to make mud bricks. Um, also how indigenous traditional foodways, traditional ovens, for example. 
And I've taken this particular project of building these mud ovens and cooking them to the contemporary US-Mexico border. They are indigenous to this landscape for the last 400 years, but it's actually an immigrated technology that came to what we now call the United States 400 years ago via Spain and via North Africa. And so I'm embarked on a project along with an international aid organization called Alight to build earthen ovens in migrant shelters along the US-Mexico border um, to help people, because all across America, people are, the Americas, people are familiar with this type of, of traditional cooking, whether it's in their memory, uh, their historic memory, their grandparents may have cooked on them or they cooking on them today. And so this is one that we recently built in Nogales, Mexico. And what's interesting about this act of building is when the the woman the the nun who runs this particular shelter in Nogales was interviewed and asked, "What are you building here?" And of course, we were building the Orno, but her answer was, "We are building. What are we building? We're rebuilding. We're rebuilding people. We're rebuilding people who've undergone a traumatic journey, um, and we're rebuilding them physically and emotionally and psychologically before they continue on their journey from here forward." forward. And so how this act of building, uh, you know, is an integral part of this story of the expanded borderlands. Part of this journey also involves the migration of technology. And we worked on a project where we wondered if we could take samples of clay from both the United States and Mexico along the US-Mexico border with potters from Juarez and El Paso, as well as geologists and um, and a professor of ceramics from the University of Texas, El Paso. And what we discovered was this broad, let's say set of, of complexions of clays from whites to browns, uh, to tans, to even greens. And we asked the potters to use a 3D printer to make a series of objects. So we had brought a technology to a landscape, but also brought a technology to a craft that wasn't familiar with 3D printing. And so we developed a software application that anyone could really use. And we asked each potter from both countries using this clay from both countries to make a pot. And they were so excited by this project, they actually made about 270 pots over the course of several weeks. And these are some examples of those objects that we call uh, borderland pottery. And this is the, the soil and the complexion and the craft and skill of, of potters. But as a designer and as a professor of architecture, I've always been curious about how the same technology might reassert or reaffirm or question the way that construction technologies have existed for thousands of years within the borderlands. Could we print something at the architectural scale? And this is sort of what we've been envisioning. And so we've taken this project to task, envisioning a robot that could print the mud from the borderlands itself. Uh, we developed a 3D printer with an industry partner that could print very large objects. And for the first time in history, after thousands of years of building with mud in the borderlands, we're thinking about how we might build in a new way, how we might take the soil from the landscape, uh, recalling the construction techniques of the Mogollon, of the Pueblo, of indigenous people across the Americas and really across the world to think about how we might make new ways of building in the 21st century, ways of thinking about lightness when mud is usually a heavy material and how we bring new technologies to it, uh, how we think about how this might become a house, for example, printing stairs, um, how we might make functional pottery in the ways that functional pottery have been made in this landscape for thousands of years, but using new techniques and, and new tools and making forms and spaces We just lost Ronald. I, if everybody, if maybe we'll, let's just wait and uh, a minute and see if we can regain him.
Well, as we wait, I will say, I was thinking about the synergy with the work that we're about to hear Mahmoud uh, Kishavas talk about um, where with these ovens, what Ronald Rael was describing was a way in which design is used to facilitate life in motion and how what Mahmoud will talk about is another way that design is actually being used to facilitate lives in motion uh, to facilitate mobility itself. Um, I'm wondering if we should continue to wait. I'm going to ask um, our extraordinary administration manager, Ariana uh, Seha, what you think we should do. OK. We will, we will move on. <laughs> Let's, so what we're going to do is we're going to start um, a presentation by Mahmoud Keshavars. And I really hope Ronald Rael is able to rejoin us. And if he does, we will wait until Mahmoud finishes before Ronald uh, finishes his presentation. OK, so thank you, Mahmoud. Sure. Um, let's see. Yeah. Can I share? Um, yes, thank you, Letty, for, for inviting me. And um, hi to everyone, which i not able to see <laughs> faces. It's kind of weird. So today I'm going to talk about a bit about the, type, the work that I've done in kind of last, uh, yeah, almost um, nine years. Um, and a book that I published um, on that topic, the design politics of the passport. Um, so my interest lies a lot. I mean, we there is lots of discussion about borders, and there are lots of um, type of research and a scholarship, all kind of helpful and interesting. But I'm, I'm, I, I'd be more interested on 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 when we talk about borders and the ways in which they are made or technologies that are used, um, often discuss or give a sense of kind of an advancement of security technology, surveillance, all these new techniques, these high-tech uh, companies involved. But uh, I was interested to go to something that might be very mundane or for some people very out of date. And that's kind of the artifact of the passport. So what I did is um, I, I, I didn't look at this artifact from the perspective of those who, who, who has this kind of artifact, the citizens, so to speak, but from the perspective of those who don't have access to one or don't have access to a good one. Um, undocumented migrants, stateless uh, refugees, um, migrants who use kind of forged passports to cross um, over borders. So, so the book kind of was this kind of ethnographic work um, around this strange artifact. As I said, mundane for some, but quite violent for other people. Um, and it has been a couple of interesting works around the artifact of passport, both historically. Some discuss this artifact as, you know, the ways in which has formed um, the state or the ways in which uh, even the monopoly over means of movement to state, John Thorpe has written about this. Uh, some others you know, taking kind of more interesting perspective, discussing this as um, not a product of nation states, as we often think that it's like an instrument that the nation state used to, let's say, manage the population, but rather as something that actually gave birth to nation states. When you look at, for example, the practice of passports, especially in the context of British empire and in the aftermath of abolition of the slavery within the British empire and the need to move indentured labor and the kind of different passporting practices around that. And uh, Radhika Mungia has written an interesting book around this. But 
one kind of common things within many of these studies of passport, it's which is also inherent in, in the kind of social science uh, treatment of materiality. It's that you stay, you, the analysis or the critique stay with the object as if that's kind of the end of the story, right? And we often, of course, talk about them as a mechanism of control and so on and so forth. But from a design perspective, I mean, the little that we heard um, from Ronald that this kind of, uh, all these made things that exist in the world, they always, they are made because there was this kind of, this ontological condition of materials to be made. So there's a possibility to remake them. So for me, the kind of next step was yeah, you analyze the passport from the perspective of people, how, how kind of historically has constructed, you know, differences allowing, let's say, race, gender, you know, and all those categories. But at the same time, there is something peculiar with, with this object that, that kind of um, can help us to think about the ways in which it's kind of remade constantly, right? Um, and that is nothing kind of strange. The state itself historically has been redesigning this passport and always keep telling us that, you know, they're coming with the best passport that is hard to forge and an impossible kind of to, to use it for other reasons. So the, the state itself kind of telling us that this is not a fixed thing. So they're constantly changing in, in, in the ways in which they have been capturing or fixating our identity, right? If historically it was about the color of like written on the passport, the color of eye, you know, the high, the name of father, these kind of category placeholders for recognizing who you really are. Now it's kind of a different technology. So it, it kind of affirms that the state itself it doesn't trust those categories in which it's strictly been working with. Um, so when you look at this object, it's, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's about, you know, bridging the gap between identity, something that's in flux, that's changing, you know, constantly, culturally, socially, biologically, and identification practices, which in, in their essence is about fixating that identity. So there is a tension there, right, between identity and identification. Right? And this gap and all this advancement is all latest technologies that keep coming up. Uh, they are, um, um, they are kind of coming to fix this kind of gap, which is impossible to overcome. Um, so this gap is always this kind of idea of that the bodies, right, or identities have the capacity for disability. So when, when you look at the histories of passport or different technologies of identification controls at the border, you see that there is this, this conception that bodies can be deceivable. And this is something that you can see historically, you know, in, and, and it goes back to the practice of surveillance within chattelist slavery, you know, regulation of migration of Chinese women to the USA with the Chinese Exclusion Act, or regulation of the indentured laborers, as I said, after the abolition of the slavery within the British Empire. Um, so this kind of bridging this gap is always assumed that, that the unknown individuals, you know, unknown in relation to that kind of authority, uh, can be known at any moment and any site by capturing and recording um, some unique features of their bodies. So there is here this attempt to, to, to design or understand bodies in terms of their unique features, which can be written, recorded in order to be reread again, right, at any moment at which. Um, so again, the, the, what's happening here at the, at the heart of this, this object, which I studied again, both from the historical perspective, ethnographic work, um, is that is to produce a sign and check this, this material and corporal links between the body, its attributed nationality, gender, age, and its possibilities to move, reside, and act and act as within territory. So what happens is that when you materialize, when the right to move is summarized and materialized through designing a passport, then the lack of such material presence would result in the lack of exactly the right which has been manufactured through the passport. So you see that the, it's not just a matter of representation. Um, it happens that you deprive one from one's passport, confiscate one's passport, or make one's passport worth nothing. You make one's body immobile or worse illegal, right, around the specific borders. But again, there is this paradox of 
identity and identification practices, right? So, so the gap or paradox of trying to tame and fix an unfixable thing, that is identity, uh, which, as I said, reflects in constantly on a state attempt to, to design the most secure borders, uh, it's also the place in which historically practices of deception, forgery, and fakery take place. And that's why what I'm saying, the design perspective comes in, that you don't, you don't believe that this object is, is as solid and can, you can, you can stop your analysis at the edge of that object. This object will redesign historically, which means there are non-state actors who can also redesign it and remake it. And that's where passport forgers come to the picture, which I've kind of um, interviewed some and, and, and it's, it's in the book. But today I'm gonna kind of take that one level further and, and, and discuss some of the aspects around this forgery and how it kind of does this and remaking of the passport into other direction, albeit very momentarily. You know, it doesn't, the, the forged passport doesn't guarantee citizenship rights, but it gives you a momentary kind of access to cross the border, for example, in, or, in order to uh, claim asylum. And the context in which I discuss here, of course, it's Europe, which is kind of a very different context compared to Europe, to, compared to the USA. Um, so the thing is that once you materialize, abstract notions such as identity, citizenship, the right to move, which cannot in itself be guaranteed without materialization. So these are the abstract notions that they need to be materialized in order to be operationalized. But once you materialize them, also you make them vulnerable, right? Because anything that are made can be remade, right? Anything that's, or anything that's designed, that's kind of one of the main features in, in design education the possibility of remaking the main, made things. Um, so what's happening is that any made things in the world can be copied, remade, prototyped, morphed, and so on. And this goes you know, from simple things, but also very complicated things like passport. So if, for example, if you look at in 2018, and the Council of European Union published an extensive list of technical terms uh, in an attempt to standardize all the security features of passport globally. Uh, and these are, you know, some of those from that list. These are from a book I'm, I'm working with the graphic designer, which focuses a lot on this idea of what we call reconfiguring borders. Um, and the aim that with the EU was to, to generate a common unified standard language among EU states to what they call fighting illegal immigration and organized crime. Um, and this is around 150 page document documenting more than 100 techniques of making passports and documents necessary for a secure identification at border. There are all these deep, deep complicated technologies. You need, you need you see that some of them are even um, registered marks. So there is also intellectual property behind all these technologies. Uh, and these are all kind of Many of them are technologies produced by companies that also are kind of giant companies within the arm industry. For example, you know, Thales, it's a French multinational company, which is, I think, the sixth biggest arm exporter in the world. It's among the second arm exporter to, to North Africa and Middle East, which also is the main or first contractor of biometric passport in Europe. So you see the connection and, and kind of the irony, right? You, you manufacture arms there and then people supposed to come here would not, I mean, would be stopped by the same technology of the same company at the border. But when, when you look at these kind of technologies, and that's what, that's what the power always love about itself, right? To propagate a sense of domination and mastery that we, we, have, we, have, we have everything under control. Look at all these complicated technologies. But when you look at this from the perspective of those who always, see these made things as a possibility, as, as, as something that can be remade. Like for example, in the words of Amir Haydari, um, a well-known um, smuggler in mostly during 90s, 80s, uh, that helped or have helped move um, many refugees and, and travelers without the right papers, that's the term I use to refer in the book, travelers without right papers, um, his perspective on this issue, it's, it's quite different. So he told me in an interview I did with him a few years ago that the world is a forged reality. When I asked him, you know, how does he see his practice? 
And he told me forgery is what the state does. The state is a forged entity in itself. So if Sweden issues 9 million passports to define a no nation called Sweden, why can't I issue 100,000 passports to those who flee war, conflict, and violence and are in urgent need of help and movement? So based on what moral position am I a forger, a criminal, and the state is not? What is forgery? Forging is an act of making something out of nothing. It is bringing to existence something unnatural and presents it as natural, like the state, like the borders made by the state. They are forged, they are made. They are unnatural things that look or make us believe that they are natural. Making borders is a form of forgery too. Now you tell me, who is the big forger here? The state or me? Um, so in, in persecution documents from um, his court in 2016, he, he was deported from Sweden in 2011 for sentences that he, he got due to um, forgery or human smuggling that was kind of his crime. Uh, and in the persecution documents, which I was going through uh, last year, there are several pages of Photoshop files that they found on his computers at his apartment. And um, the, the persecutors have marked, um, you know, the, the address of where the file is stored. But also here for those who don't speak Swedish, it says 16 layers. So here the persecutor was opening each of these files on Photoshop and was looking how this page of a passport was broken to different layers, right? Like different placeholders. So that the forger, for example, cut, you know, the image, you know, cut different placeholders, the name, birth, and date of birth, so on and so forth. And this, uh, this rep was represented as a kind of evidence of a crime in the court. Or even during the old court session, they showed an, an image of a Photoshop, um, and, and a screenshot of a Photoshop where they showed how, how the forger had broken the passport into different layers. Here, here you see the layers exist as a way to, to, to tell us that, you know, the forgery happened as if the state itself does not, I mean, the state produced passport through these layers, right? So the forgery what it does is just expose that, right? It shows that the, this identity is, it's made out of nothing. So if you just reconfigure uh, different elements in, in, in a right order, a person born in, in Copenhagen all of a sudden can be, you know, a person born in Tehran uh, all of a sudden can be a Danish uh, traveler crossing border. So questioning this, this um, taken for granted notions and uh, that is uh, connected to border. Uh, so, and then if, for example, we look at this, this photo from a press conference in, in Bangkok from um, 2016, where the police arrested um, 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 a famous forger that we're looking for for, for 10 years. Um, you see here an Interpol officer leaning towards and looking at this um, uh, the threads, and he's kind of amazed, but also confused that how come a person for 10 years can produce passport. These are the materials they found in the workshops of this guy when they arrested him that how come this person can produce this high quality passport with the materials that basically worth few dollars, uh, you know, as opposed to these high tech um, technologies that, you know, cost a fortune of money from taxpayers basically to, to give us security in relation to other identities. Um, and in a way one can think about in the spirit of authorities perception of, you know, Photoshop, uh, as a forgery program, that was something the police officers in their persecution, in their documents constantly referred to Photoshop as a forgery program. And I kind of like that. And I tell my students, you know, this is a forgery program. Uh, so in, in, one can think of, you know, this in the speed of authorities perception of Photoshop as a forgery program. Um, one cannot resist, but to see a haber dashery shops like this one in this photo as a forgery shops, right? So if you think about the previous photo, um, let's go back. So these are the kind of stuff you buy in like a haberdashery shop. And, and, and this is kind of forgery shop, you know, with those creative kids. 
so this is a shop that mostly serves children and provi provide materials for hobby related activities. Yeah. So there is astonishing similarities between the press conference setting and this shop. And in a way, it shows what I want to kind of suggest how this kind of forgery techniques that, that in a way, you know, reassign this, this constructed nationalities to bodies who are were not entitled those kind of nationalities in order to be able to cross freely and safely or travel safely. How these practices in a way in a way, it's a form of profaning the borders, right? So making the borders a kind of a playful thing and a place that, you know, supposed to give us this sense of security, this kind of, with all these technologies, you know, 100 page and 50 page documents of different technologies that need to be used to have a secure passport. All of a sudden can be, you know, uh, trash, like I say, uh, with, with, uh, with this type of material. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are now going to resume. Uh, Ronald Raya will pick up where he left off before his computer shut down. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. My computer just decided to shut down all of a sudden. Um, so I think I was talking about building with a traditional material using a technology that immigrated to the landscape. And just continuing that, I wanted to talk about this project, Casa Covida which is a house that during the time of COVID, we've constructed using this technology as we came back to our homeland in the borderlands. And it's a house that explores these ideas of indigenous and traditional ways in the borderlands, but rethought through the lens of the technology. Each of these volumes has a different program, a place for sleeping, a place for cooking and, and gathering and a place for bathing. And, you can see the interiors of this. So every component of this is crafted by hand. Even the textiles are made with our friends who are indigenous weavers from the region. Um, the wood is gathered from the forests here. The earth is gathered from the site. The pottery is fired in the kiln. And I guess I was reflecting on Mahmoud's presentation about this idea of passport and technology. And maybe this is something we'll think about a little bit more in, in the conversation, but how within the context of design, there are, are certain rules you, you have to follow that speak to success. And in some ways I have an identity and passport that allows me to try something different and to break away from those avenues of, of, of what defines design and what defines architecture. While we were building these experiments in the desert, um, there was increased news about child separation at the border. And we were here wanting to participate in the protest, wanting to contribute in some ways using the tools of our discipline and our profession. And so we elected that we would um, create a graphic design for use in, in protests in the cities. Some of our friends wanted posters that they could use in the protest, to protest child separation. And this particular sign is a sign that's iconic, especially in California, but iconic relative to the conversation of immigration. And it has an interesting design story, which um, comes from the borderlands itself ex and explicitly the historical borderlands in New Mexico. Um, it was designed by a Navajo graphic designer who was working for the California Department of Transportation. He was asked to uh, design a sign that would warn oncoming motorists of people who were dropped off alongside the road, the immigrants who were dropped off alongside the road and might attempt to run across the highway uh, to, to get out of the middle of, of the highway. And, and so he was very empathetic to the plight of the immigrant today. He saw it comparable to that of the Navajo during the long walk when they were forced to migrate from their traditional lands to where they are in New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, and it's a journey, it's a tragic journey where, where hundreds lost their lives during this forced migration. So he did two things that were interesting, I think. One is that he used a little girl with pigtails because he thought that uh, motorists would empathize 
uh, most with that particular figure, but he smuggled in the silhouette of the head of the civil rights leader Cesar Chavez as the head of the father in the sign. And so this is a, a brilliant piece of design activism in, in my opinion. It's a design that emerges from the borderlands. And we made some, one simple move in making the sign is to turn the families to face each other and use the word reunite instead of caution. And so we made this available to download. You can still download it today. Um, and people begin to download it and, and use it in protest. But it was picked up by one of the largest art, uh, public art campaigns in the world called Four Freedoms. And we had the opportunity to bring this sign back to the highway in a way that we would have never anticipated, which was in the form of an enormous billboard so that hundreds of thousands of motorists could um, see this sign which brought attention to this issue of child separation at the border. And the sign continues to be seen. It's on the walls of the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in, in New York City right now. And people are downloading it and installing it in street signs all over Los Angeles. Um, and it was for a time, the facade of the Johnson Museum in Cornell for an exhibition on uh, border art. And what's interesting about this, this process to me was that we realized that we could smuggle in political ideas or activism or agendas into the context where that conversation did not necessarily always take place. Um, and so the, the final project I'm going to show you is called Teeter Totter Wall. And there's a project that comes from the book uh, Border Wall as Architecture. And we know that despite the previous regimes, the announcement that he would in fact build a wall on the US-Mexico border, there was already close to, actually close to 800 miles of wall already in place by the time he became uh, the leader of the regime at an enormous cost. And we were working quite a bit in both the historic borderlands and the contemporary borderlands. And we were documenting stories that were emerging because of the people and landscapes that the wall was putting in danger. Um, and one of the illustrations that we created to tell these stories was the idea that the wall um, the, or the border itself could be a fulcrum between US-Mexico relations that it spoke to the uh, equality and inequality, the labor and trade balances that existed at the border in relationship between the two countries. And so this was one drawing that we produced back in 2009, and also a small model that we did to tell the story. And there, there are countless of, uh, number of these models and drawings that we made. Uh, however, this one seemed to catch the attention of the public imagination. And we were asked several times to build this um, and, and realize it. Uh, I think many people thought our illustrations were propositions for a wall, especially because the, the book came out at the time that Trump became president, even though the book didn't really ever mention the president, because uh, in my imagination, uh, prior to the election, he would not have become president, but eventually he did. And so there was this idea that these were propositions for a wall, and they were actually illustrations of a wall that already existed. But this one moved towards the prop proposition. And we worked with arts organizations to see if it could be realized, but the Department of Homeland Security and US Border Patrol consistently said that we could not do this on the wall. Um, but as designers, and we wanted to allow this object just to simply exist in the world, what would it mean to smuggle this design to the wall? We traveled to the wall and we carried objects to the wall to see how long it would take for Border Patrol agents to arrive. We designed a way that the teeter-totter could be slipped into the wall and be installed very quickly within that time frame of their arrival. And we actually made a collaboration with a, with a arts collective in Juarez, Mexico to see the object realized itself. Um, and these conversations continued to think about, you know, how would we attach it to the wall? And if we look very closely, we see how it's smuggled into the wall itself. This is now not a metaphorical fulcrum, but a literal fulcrum possibly between the US-Mexico relations. And we painted it pink because, uh, you know, that we wanted it to stand apart from the wall itself, even though 
this teeter-totter is made of the same exact material of the wall itself. However, in Juarez, uh, the color pink is very important. And wherever you see pink crosses, you remember the women who were killed during the time of extreme violence in Juarez, Mexico, when it was one of the most violent cities in the world. And while we recognize that this object was an instrument of play, and it was also an instrument of activism, we wanted to remember that if it were to be installed, it would be installed within a context of violence, and we could not forget that component either. So with increased conversations about child separation at the border and threats of increased wall construction, uh, we elected that one day we would just simply go to the wall and invite some communities and install the teeter-totter. And I'll just let you watch because this is how that happened that day. It all happened very quickly. And by the time I placed that teeter-totter down and there was already a child climbing on to it um, on, on both sides. And I think what was fascinating to me that in fact, Border Patrol arrived in the exact amount of time that we predicted they would arrive. And they asked what we were doing. And we simply said, we were having an event with children and so they parked their vehicle and stood back and they took some photographs and smiled. We even invited them to participate and they thought maybe that wouldn't be so professional of them. Um, and soon after that, the Mexican National Guard arrived heavily armed and they asked what we, we were doing. And we said, we're having an event with children. And they stood back and smiled and took photographs. And what I discovered is that the wall itself is a federal project, which means it's a public project, which means that the people who occupy those spaces can decide what happens in those spaces. That despite the wall's intention to separate people and divide people and keep them apart, it has brought people together in really remarkable ways. And this was just a moment where we were learning from the forms of activism that are already existing in the borderlands, uh, enabling them to share binational identities and, and relationships and friendships across the border. And so a sanctuary was made by the, the grandmothers and mothers and children who largely attended this event that day. And what we didn't anticipate is that this project would be seen by millions of people across the world because it was just a very humble, small event. And the power of social media took it to the entire world, I think, and, and I think they were moved because they recognize the, the generosity that exists within the act of play on this particular playground equipment, that the actions that take place on one side have a direct consequence on the other. And there's a generosity that's implied when playing on a teeter-totter, that one's pleasure and enjoyment entirely relies on one's generosity on the other side to have that ex experience. And so, I think for, for, for the brief 40 minutes that this happened, we were able to show the, the power of the relationships that it can exist at the border and how the power of play can serve as a device to overcome boundaries that exist in our way. So thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much. Um, this is, it's just so amazing to think about both of your work at the same time and all the different synergies and overlaps there are. And just to pull out a few, but before I do that, I want to encourage our audience, if you have questions or comments, please post them in the chat. And I, I look to see who you were and I see some uh, individuals who are attending who I think will have really interesting um, questions uh, for us. Um, so one thing that I'm thinking about, uh, both of you were talking about um, the border in some way as uh, uh, something that, as Mahmoud said, can be profaned, like that it's sacred in some way, but through humor or play, like the humor or play is in some ways taken as um, removing the dignity of the, the passport or of the actual physical border itself. Um, and so I was interested to hear more about 
um, when is humor understood as 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 humor and when is it taken as something that um, is profane. Um, I was also interested in how um, thinking about the word forgery and the word to forge right and sort of thinking about like a blacksmith's forge and like for like the relationship between forging making and designing like how are those things uh, or those verbs like or unlike one another. Um, I was also thinking about how um, both of you were talking about how things that are made can be remade right um, and what does that suggest in terms of different kinds of design technologies that might um, facilitate movement if we think about what has been made as like these borders that create these nation state structures as uh, the real forgery to quote um, the forger that Mahmoud was, was interviewing. Um, I was also thinking about the, the actual physical um, traffic sign that Ronald was talking about and how um, I'm pretty sure Mahmoud knows about this um, since I think we talked about this before that that image um, has moved to Europe and actually with the with different texts, not caution, but welcome refugees is the iconic image of the 2016 uh, refugee welcoming um, activity, protest activity uh, that has happened across Europe. Um, and that that image has also been manipulated in sometimes really disturbing ways. Um, so for example, by far right political parties in Germany that uh, take the image and instead turn it into uh, men chasing a woman. Uh, and instead of saying welcome refugees, it says rape fugees unwelcome or uh, turns it into um, uh, a knight on a, on a horse with a lance chasing the man and the woman who, so the, the child actually isn't in the picture, the child is now chasing the man and the woman and the man and the woman are holding weaponry and the woman is wearing like a full length burqa. And so these are, and it says Islamists not welcome. I and mean, so all kinds of amazing ways where uh, design is so important in terms of conveying the politics um, uh, of this moment. Um, and I'm just eager to hear your responses uh, to that and to our audience uh, posing questions for our panelists. So if either of you have anything to say to each other or to, in response to anything I just said, that would be wonderful. Sure, that's a lot That's a lot to think about, Letty. Thank you. Yeah. I'll just briefly comment on the first point that you brought up, which was about, about play and, and, and about humor. Um, and in the borderlands, in fact, in, in my view of it, there exist you know all all of the contradictions and and um, binaries of of Mexico, the United States, of wealth, of poverty, of of Mexican and Anglo. But I think there's another one which is horror and humor. Mm. And I I think that there are exist the horrors of of poverty and xenophobia and and racism uh, and. But I also think that that humor is consistently used as a way to overcome those horrors, uh, and 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 we see that present throughout. And I and I really appreciated uh, learning of Mahmoud's work, which I think there is an underlying humor to the work. There's a playfulness to that that allows us to engage what is um, can be very sensitive topics and and open them up and dismantle them and present them in new ways. Um, yeah, there, there were like four things, but I think they're kind of to some degree they related in, in the sense of what you talk about, about the, the meaning of the forge, you know, in your context in the US, you often talk about constitutions being forged, right, which is kind of interesting because also, you know, there is this kind of double double meaning of you make things out of nothing, right? It didn't exist, but at the same time, it means that, I mean, the other meaning of that, you're copying things, right? Mm -hmm. So in, it's, it's in, it, in it, I think, I mean, the term in many sense points to this whole idea of make things are made that basically you never, I mean, this is one of the 
in the modern notion of design or you know the design education you always think that you design thing out of nothing right there is this creative uh, individual who come bow you know has this wow moment and then make things out of nothing you know do this kind of magic but in practice you know any form of design any form of making is a form of manipulation of the relation that exists of the materials it's a form of displacement right you take things from here to there you reconfigure things you remake things you rearrange the materials you rearrange the forces the relations you know the labor by kind of act of designing so all form of design in a way, it's, it's kind of a form of remaking things that already exist, right? And we often learn this in design schools about, you know, my background is industrial design, so products, you know, this thing, thing. but we never talk about borders in that sense, right? So there is this kind of clear cut between, let's say, borders, passports, this thing as something in one way sacred, but also as if something so complicated or just merely instrumental so it's the law it's the politics and these are just instruments right or protocols that get this shit but in practice when you look at it i mean those kind of laws or or rights cannot operate without this materialization right so i i want to go back to this idea of how basically i mean like type of work uh, it, it's kind of this the, the remaking right you take the same material you give another shape all of, all of a sudden the wall becomes something else right so so this kind of intervention in design which at the same time which there is this violence in design right it's a design that makes the wall possible right uh, it's the design the capacity of design that makes all this materialization around passport you know all this possible but at the same time Exactly, because they are made, they can be remade to other things. So the question is this question of orientation. How do you orientate your, your kind of capacity or the capacity of design towards what direction, right? Towards the ways in which design being always used or you, towards kind of other direction. And here, you know, you look at, you know, the struggles on the ground, how people experience those who are kind of subject by the violence of design, how they themselves uh, figure out uh, or configure other ways of kind of um, getting back to this. So, yeah. Do either of you have questions for each other? Um, well, I, I was I was curious about. Um, I, I was wondering if you were also working on. Uh, designs for new passports yourself as a, as a designer. They're, 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 I, I didn't see that necessarily, but I, I think that the research that you've done has dismantled the, the, the meaning and, and also the materiality of a passport and the techniques of a passport. And so it seems like what you have empowered yourself with is also the possibility to make new kinds of passports and, and what that means. And I, it's kind of exciting to me. Yeah, I mean, in a way, this was something that I also struggled a lot because I was trying to see that in, you know, in the work of the forgers, right? That how how people already do it um, in a way, and you know, in, in at the heart of the passport, there is this this violence, right? That it's it is at the end of the day out fixating, right? It's about it's a way of a, a representation that's on of you that's on a state terms, right? We all know that legally none of us own our passport. The states can take them anyway at any moment. And historically we've been doing that. It's just a matter of geopolitics. So we don't own them, right? Even though we keep them, you know, all the punch funds and all these things, but we don't own them. And the states can kind of remake them. Biometric passports can, you know, store information about, you know, tax, taxation, all these things. So the passport instead of this object, it is, in itself um, a violent object. The question I think, I mean, if you're supposed to redesign the passport, I think it would be within that scope that the forgers already do, right? So you, you kind of remake this practically for a person to cross, right? The person that was not entitled one. And at the same time, by doing that, you question those categories, right? Or those, those kind of identification categories that's supposed to work uh, and show that these, these are arbitrary, they don't work. But to design a new passport, I mean, there also uh, there is this kind of issue of 
because a passport is this article is a specific historical technological articulation right that define this kind of unknown body make that unknown body knowable to authority so the question would be do i design or do we design do, would a, another design of the passport make this go away i'm not sure the question would be how maybe we can think of the ways in which encounters across different space or territories can be done through kind of other means or this sense of trust because what passport tells us historically that we have outsources we have given up on trusting each other we have now given that possibility to a third actor that is a state or technology company to to assure that when i'm going to meet you on the other side of or in another territory i'm no danger to you or you're not no danger to me so we have given up this trust to a third actor the question would be how how we take that back right so, and in that context, maybe passport is not necessary. Then we have to think about kind of other ways in which to, to, to kind of establish those kind of connection with each other. Um, so again, this, I think the passport is always about this third actor taking over our relationship and encounters. Ronald, when you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I, I was just thinking how you, you really enlightened me to, almost think about some of the work that I'm doing, like the Ordno project, that the Ordno is actually a passport, maybe a new mm -hmm. kind of passport, because a passport also is a permission slip. Yeah. And what I what we discovered in building the Ordnos and the migrant shelters is that all that sort of gave people permission to reinforce their own cultural traditions and values. So they've come from many different parts of the world. And now they're stuck along the US-Mexico border and they're all living together and they have very different cultures. But the, the, that object itself allowed them to say, oh, we cook this way and maybe we can make a little addition to it and cook the way that we cook. And let me share that food with you. Let me share that practice with you. And so it's kind of a permission and a relationship of safety. And so maybe there are other ways to conceive of a passport rather than as a document, but as a different kind of object that allows permission, but doesn't have the embedded violence within it. Yeah. I think that's a really beautiful note to end on. I'm so sorry, we, we have no more time, um, but I'm hoping this is actually a conversation that continues uh, between the two of you. And I'm so grateful that both of you were able to have it with the rest of us today. And this will live on um, on our website as well. So thank Great. you both so much. And thank you so much. Be well. Yeah. Okay. Take care. Well, thank so you. nice to meet you. Thank Mahmoud. you. Ben, nice to meet you, you Letty. Yeah. You too. Bye.